Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, really happy to be back in California. Um, yeah, so uh, given the format of, of uh, the, the, the panel today, I thought that I would just sort of breeze through some of the background about uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, what we know about it, um, and then sort of some of the, the political impetus um, for what's happening, some of my personal experiences um, traveling the region, talking to um, uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs um, who have uh, left Xinjiang and their relatives. Uh, and I also recently uh, made a trip to Xinjiang earlier this month, just just um, two weeks ago. Uh, and so I was hoping to actually get some pictures uh, up and to, to share with you to sort of compare and contrast what the situation was like at the, at the height of stuff in, in 2017 versus today. Um, unfortunately, I was detained uh, on, a, on a train um, at, at one point and lost um, uh, some of those pictures that I, that, that I was pressured to, to delete by the police. But um, I still have a few that, and, and hopefully we could sort of take a look at that. Um, so, uh, and then um, after me, I'll, I'll let Darren sort of, you know, get into the nitty gritty because he's pretty much unparalleled in terms of his his knowledge and his his commitment to to researching what's going on. Um, it's uh, yeah, he's he's really spectacular. So, um, anyway, uh, so uh, to, to to begin, just a quick. Um, background about the, the scale of, of this and what's happening. So um, as you can see here, um, you all in the audience probably uh, know that there are um, an estimated somewhere between 1 million, 1.5 million uh, US government says as many as 3 million um, ethnic Uyghurs uh, who are a Turkic uh, Muslim minority um, in, in far west China. Um, who have been detained in this system of, of uh, re-education centers uh, out of a population of about 11 to 13 million. So that's something like one in six adults. Um, how did experts arrive at this number? It's by interviewing um, Uyghurs who have left the, the region. It, it's through documents, uh, government documents um, that have come out um, in, uh, I, I think one of them uh, was through um, Istiklal TV, sort of Turkish-based uh, Uyghur expatriate media. Um, in other cases, uh, news outlets like uh, Radio Free Asia have simply called up um, some of these local officials in, in, in some of these townships and said, hey, how, 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 how many people are you guys um, sort of you know, sending into some of these places? And, and, and sometimes they've gotten answers. And so that's where that estimate comes out uh, from. The scope and the, and the size of these camps. Uh, so uh, there has been sort of these, um, you know, volunteer researchers. Uh, there have been um, Uyghur uh, overseas uh, groups that have scoured through uh, essentially several sources of information um, through publicly available. This is online government um, documents. Sort of, you know, when when local governments seek uh, bidders to to build uh, these installations also through Google Earth and other uh, satellite imagery. So the estimates anywhere between 200 and around 270, according to a, uh, a Chinese student researcher named Shang Zhang. Uh, the East Turkestan uh, National Awakening Movement, uh, this young man, Sali Hudayar, uh, Uyghur gentleman in Washington, uh, thinks he's found six, uh, sorry, 465. Uh, German researcher Adrian Zen says there's anywhere between uh, 1,000 and, and 1,200 or even more. If and, and he's basing this on uh, the, the assumption that every township um, in, in the region, which is the size of Iran more or less, um, has, uh, has, has a re-education center. But again, estimates very, very wild, uh, widely, and um, the, 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 the opacity of this data is, is very high, so we can't really say much for certain. Um, uh, okay, uh, so you know, how did this start? Um, the current party secretary in, in, in Xinjiang is a man named Chen Xuanguo. He's now 64, and he was transferred from Tibet uh, in August of 2016 uh, to Xinjiang. Um, that was a period when uh, it was about seven years after a uh, very uh, sort of you know, large-scale uh, unrest uh, in Xinjiang of, of race riots that saw several hundred people die, um, mostly Han, uh, also some Uyghurs. Uh, there were also a series of um, 
of, 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 uh, of, of terror attacks, um, including one at a train station in China. And so basically he was transferred, he was seen sort of as a Communist Party hard man, sort of nearing uh, the end of his career, and he had done um, a, a, a pretty a sort of heavy-handed job of uh, kind of tightening security with a series of sort of a, a network of uh, police installations all over Tibet's uh, major city streets. And so when he arrived in August of 2016, he immediately began to roll out uh, this vision. And so what did we have? We had uh, the, the same sort of grid-style policing. Uh, it's called the uh, sort of the Bianming, uh, Jing Wujan. So these are sort of little uh, police stations that pop up um, every 400 meters, um, basically every block. Um, you have these roving sort of patrols of armored and armed police uh, bearing sticks, shields, uh, riot armor, uh, rifles, uh, who are just basically constantly patrolling the streets. Uh, uh, Uyghurs begin to have their passports confiscated to prevent them from, from going abroad. And through documents, um, we sort of were able to flesh out, beginning in late 2016, 2017, what else was going on. And this campaign's scale is absolutely vast. Um, there was a, a massive um, effort to collect biometric uh, data from essentially every single citizen of this region of 20 million uh, so that included DNA, that included sort of, you know, blood type, uh, things like that. Um, there started to be uh, a, a massive drive to sort of improve the government's um, ability to surveil electronically. Um, so uh, enormous spending went into uh, these um, technology companies that provided um, the, the, the tools that allowed police to monitor what was happening on WeChat, but also to um, on the street to, to scan people's phones that you know you could sort of plug these machines into an iPhone it would instantly sort of crack the the, the, the security and retrieve photos, videos, um, messages, and a list of what sorts of apps were, were on your phones. At the neighborhood level, um, a lot of sort of um, reporting, right? So uh, um, neighborhood committees were asked to sort of. Um, do surveys, okay, which Uyghur man, did they pray five times a day? Did they keep a beard? Did they attend mosque uh, a little bit too frequently, so to speak? Um, these might all be signs of, of, of extremism. And so essentially we saw this, we saw the entire region go into overdrive. Um, at one point there were state media reports that, you know, every single car in the region was, was, was in one small area was required to install GPS trackers. Um, there were reports of, of Uyghur uh, officials being penalized because they didn't want to smoke in front of more devout Muslims. And, and that might have been a sign that they were quote unquote extremists themselves. Um, and we saw massive rallies here in that upper right and lower right picture. That's uh, 2017, about Chinese New Year, February period, Chen Chiang sort of setting the tone that he's the new man in town. This is going to be a highly militarized operation. Uh, and you had sort of the armored streets patrolling the, 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 the armored cars patrolling the streets um, after that. So I, I just kind of want to talk about you know, how I came across um, this story because I think it does inform the, 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 the motivations for the Chinese government campaign. Um, so in 2017, I was writing a series of stories about the rise of Han ethno-nationalism and, and sort of Islamic phobia um, in the age of, of Xi Jinping. Um, at the same time, I was uh, also writing about the, the phenomenon of Uyghurs who in 2014, 2015, mostly had been uh, leaving uh, China through various means and eventually ending up in Turkey. Uh, sorry, in Turkey and then to Syria. Um, some of them went because they were, they, they wanted to join um, Islamic Jihad. Um, others simply wanted uh, to get a piece of land because they heard on um, social media apps that, uh, you know, this was sort of a, a paradise for, for Muslims. Um, so, but for whatever reason, you know, there was this migration happening in those years that I think, you know, certainly combined with some of these attacks that we were seeing um, in Xinjiang and in other places in China sort of uh, informed the government's kind of overreaction 
um, on, a, on a massive scale um, to, to sort of what was happening, but um, I'll come back to that. And, and so middle of 2017, um, you know, I, we had heard that in uh, basically in, in Egypt, um, every single Chinese Uyghur, uh, Chinese national Uyghur student was being rounded up and deported back to uh, China. And then they were starting to disappear. We had no idea what the scale, how urgent things were. But as I was in Turkey, actually talking to some of these, um, some of these, some of these migrants, um, I started to realize that um, you know basically every single family um, had somebody who had gone back to China or had somebody who had disappeared, had somebody. Um, who had messaged them, the, all their relatives overseas, and told them that I can't talk to you anymore, and then sort of fell into this cone of silence. Um, by late 2017, uh, you know, uh, reporters began to make trips to Xinjiang, and that was when we really sort of began to understand the, the, the full scale of what was happening. But it was all shrouded in, in sort of kind of mystery because of the extent of, of, of digital surveillance um, and the impossibility of, of you know, people inside the region talking to their loved ones outside. Um, so I guess, you know, one of the stories I wrote was, was on the left where, um, I, I, you probably can't read the, the text, but the beginning of it basically describes how, um, you know, there, I, I went to see a mother um, outside of the city of Korla. Um, her other relatives who in Turkey had heard from yet other relatives that her son had died inside one of these camps where he had disappeared several months earlier. Um, she had no idea whether he was alive or dead. Nobody had really kind of told her that her son was taken away. That just kind of went to show sort of this level of kind of the lack of transparency around this, around the system. Man on the right, he, uh, so sort of the world began to know a bit more about what was exactly happening. He was the first guy to sort of um, kind of openly talk to, to the media. Uh, so this was, um, he's, he's a Kazakh man, and um, uh, this picture was taken in, in, in um, Kazakhstan where we, where we saw him. Uh, he was born in China, and he described uh, sort of you know, spending two weeks inside of one of these re-education centers after a period of being detained by the local police in northern China uh, where he was tortured and kept, um, in some cases, under solitary confinement. For, for several months, um, he described the system inside the camps where basically, um, you know, there uh, were several uh, hundred of other detainees. Um, they sort of, you know, every morning went out, uh, raised the Chinese flag, came out, uh, came back inside to spend hours doing self-confessions about why their um, ideas about religion or, uh, you know, uh, were in fact extremist. Um, so, uh, you know, very, very basic things were equated with religious extremism that Muslims elsewhere in the world might find very, very normal. So, you know, for example, a mother teaching their kids um, about religion or, or the Quran um, under the age of 18 would be seen as a sign that she or the family is, is, is extremist. Um, and so, uh, you know, there were, and then we also spoke to others who had taught um, inside some of these camps and um, other detainees as well, a picture emerged of, you know, it's 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 pretty sort of intense around the clock forced um, indoctrination. Um, you know, there I guess physical abuse did happen. It was not the norm, but you know, it it, it was indeed sort of a, a re-education effort. Um, but there were certainly cases where you know, if he didn't listen to the teacher, he would be locked in a, in a cell by himself for, for 24 hours and stuff like that. Anyway, pictures of uh, kind of what it looked like in, in 2017, sort of the first time I went at the height of this. Uh, these pictures are taken by sort of my AP colleagues. I just cribbed them off of uh, my former employer's uh, uh, sort of photo wire. But um, so uh, facial recognition scanners you see on the left, going to every bazaar. Um, and you know train stations. Uh, you put your Shenzhen, your national ID card, you know, on the surface. Scan your face. Walk through. Um, on top of mosques, uh, you have these kind of you know patriotism enhancing signs. Here it says "Love the party, love the nation." Uh, on the left is an entrance to a re-education camp that's sort of walled off uh, in the city of Korla. On the right 
is uh, these militarized patrols that you see. Uh, and so basically, in cities like Hotan in the south of Xinjiang, uh, in Kashgar, in Urumqi, these guys, these sort of you know small platoons of, of armed police would constantly kind of you know just walk in a show of force. There would be these massive armored cavalcades of vehicles that would just circle the city, sirens blaring um, at all hours of the day uh, to basically instill this constant sense of being on alert. Uh, and, and you would see these absolutely bizarre scenes like in, in Kashgar, you would see a, a wedding caravan go by with wedding music and, um, and then like 50 meters behind it would be this basically an army convoy. Um, but they were ubiquitous and just completely enmeshed in, in, in everyday life. Um, and so in sort of 2018, 2019, more and more and more people, um, Uyghurs outside, Kazakhs outside of Xinjiang began to speak out. There was a lot more reporting done, especially by, 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 by the likes of Radio Free Asia here, um, who've been piecing together sort of the true scale of, of you know, who was being detained and, 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 and how big um, you know, this, this phenomenon was. Um, that's still happening to this day. Um, you know, this screenshot I grabbed just from a couple of days ago, I think, you know, every single day there are still sort of, you know, reports of, of who exactly is going into some of these centers. Um, so, uh, quick kind of uh, list of examples. It's not only sort of re-educating these farmers and, 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 and teaching them to speak uh, Mandarin or giving them job skills or clearing their mind of uh, religious extremism, as the government says, there's also a lot of, here as you say, see, you know, a lot of very famous, um, uh, 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 many famous uh, Uyghur academics, uh, a pop singer, a soccer star. The first man here, Ilham Todi, he was actually not really part of this list. Um, he was uh, detained and, and sentenced to life in prison earlier in 2014. Um, but that's a, that's a whole sort of another story. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about, uh, more about sort of the, the government's rationale um, and their position on all of this. So it's kind of wavered slightly. Um, for in the beginning, uh, in 2017, they didn't really respond much to international inquiries, media inquiries, international sort of, you know, questions and, and, and pressure about uh, what was happening, but they mostly said that it was a sort of an anti-extremism, anti-terror campaign. August 2018, they began to forcefully push back. Um, the uh, top official in the United Front Work Department, Julian He, tells the United Nations that China absolutely respects religious freedom and, and denies that this is happening. Later in that year, regional officials begin to sort of, you know, do an all-out propaganda push, including invitations to uh, foreign media and foreign diplomats to tour the region to show that these are, in fact, sort of job training, that there is no um, sort of, you know, suppression of, of religious freedom or no brainwashing. Um, and so there have been uh, dozens, scores, um, you know, maybe 50 of these, uh, of these trips that they've conducted so far, and it's a very, very polished kind of um, campaign. We can talk more about that later. Um, and, and, and so, you know, what, where does the, the kind of the idea, the, the germ of this campaign come from? I, I just kind of wanted to, to touch on that a little bit. We don't have much time. But, um, you know, in, in 2011, there were these two, two men, uh, Huang Gong and, and Julian He, uh, two academics uh, who sort of, you know, began writing articles. They were drawing on the work of these Chinese thinkers who, for, you know, many, many years had been saying that the Chinese um, sort of policy, the ethnic policy of essentially saying that we, at the, the, the People's Republic of China, um, as a Marxist-Leninist state, uh, are a country of many different ethnicities and we respect their distinctiveness. And we, as a part of that, we sort of grant them uh, semi-autonomy, and this is kind of a legacy of sort of this, you know, Soviet Marxist-Leninist model. Um, but, you know, some of these thinkers, including uh, Julian He, who you see here speaking at the United Nations, you know, he was, he studied terrorism, uh, he studied history, and he basically, you know, believed that China was at danger of succumbing to sort of separatist forces if it didn't sort of standardize behavior. Um, if it didn't kind of begin to roll back this notion that China's minorities are in fact distinct and should get their own sort of preferential treatment 
Um, and so he pushed for kind of a, a greater sense of, of, of Chinese identity. And they went as far in 2011, uh, uh, Hu Gang, who's a professor at Tsinghua, and Hu Lianhe, who eventually became a top government official in charge of ethnic policy, they, they, they compared China to the United States. And they should, said, you know what? China should be like the United States, which early in its history um, sort of you know, tried to make wave after wave of immigrants adopt to an Anglo-Saxon sort of template. Now, we can argue over whether or not that's been true, but that was how they saw you know, how China should sort of assimilate its people to have a Chinese national identity. Um, and I think that what they are saying kind of explains uh, more of some of the impulses and the fears of the Chinese government and its policy thinking rather than this, this, this anti-terror um, rationale, or at least it kind of fills it out. And, and I can talk about that more later. But the reason I say that is because, so right now there is also a campaign going on outside of Xinjiang in central China among a different uh, kind of, of Muslim minorities called the Hui. So these are descendants of Persians and Arabs who came to China sort of you know, hundreds of years ago. They do not have a history of extremism or militancy, uh, but yet they currently what we see in China is here's a government uh, museum exhibit in a, in a Hui area where the government sort of removed um, uh, uh, the, the skull cap from a young man as a signal to anybody who would go to visit this museum that um, you know, Islamic dress is not encouraged. Uh, and in fact, local TV stations are forbidden to show, to interview people on the street who are wearing sort of the, the caps. Here you see on the right, this is in a uh, province called Gansu. On the right, uh, sort of the, the, the word for halal uh, in Arabic has been covered up uh, because it is seen as un-Chinese. Uh, on the left is a, is a mosque I visited. Uh, the dome was taken down uh, and it is being re sort of, the, 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 the top of it is gonna be remade into a curving Chinese style um, uh, roof to sort of expunge sort of Perso-Arabic influences from, from China. Uh, this is random. I, th this is just like a, I was just driving by, but the government had basically put a tarp to cover these minarets that were being taken down on the highway. Uh, yeah, and then so here you can see, um, you know, these kind of Islamic arches uh, have been covered up because even an arch is seen as foreign and not Chinese. And, and, and the, the whole point of this campaign is to promote a sense of Chinese-ness. Um, okay, uh, jumping ahead, I guess. I, um, so, so that's just to give you an idea of, I think, you know, where the government is coming from, at least what they think they are doing. Um, and I, I recently went back to Xinjiang. I can say that I, I think that there's a, there's a huge degree of normalization on the streets. Um, I guess if there's any sort of silver lining from all this or, or a bright spot, I think that a degree of normality is somewhat returning to what is, you know, what, what you see on the streets, um, I believe as a direct response to, to government pressure. Now what's happening behind the walls of installations like these uh, with coerced labor, with um, people being sentenced outright into prisons, now that's a whole other story. I'll let Darren talk about that. Um, but basically, here's some, here's some pictures. Uh, this is outside Hotan. Uh, here uh, you see the uh, satellite image of, and then here's a picture I took just from a car of one of these centers, just to give you what they look like. Uh, here's two pictures um, taken by Reuters in 2018 at the height of the campaign, a lot of barbed wire. Um, some of this has actually come down in, in, in the last year or so. Um, Here's a picture, okay, so on the left, uh, you see the, the, the kind of the banner here saying ethnic unity uh, and uh, social stability. Uh, giant picture of Xi Jinping on, uh, video of Xi Jinping on, 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 on replay, and here's one of these kind of patrols um, going by the main bazaar in Hotan. On the right, this is 2020, um, that's all taken down, the video board's taken down, the banners have been taken down, they're going through this massive beautif city beautification campaign. Uh, 2020 here on the, on the left, this is uh, Karakaks. Um, 
so you know, life is sort of returning. You see less of the sort of the banners, less of the checkpoints on the streets. Um, on the right, uh, you know, this is at one of the airports. Whereas before, you would just see overwhelming propaganda about promoting ethnic unity, rooting out the evils of separatism, showing no mercy to militants and extremists. Now you see almost none of that. It's it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, left is what sort of uh, the the main bazaar area in Urumqi looks like today. It's kind of a lot of it has been torn down and rebuilt into sort of a very commercial kind of um, you know clean uh, but very commercial touristy area that you might see in other Chinese sort of tourist heavy spots. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, the economy's taken a hit, uh, definitely. Um, so, you know, bizarre area in, in Hotan, I believe, or, or um, yeah, is, is, you know, pretty much completely empty. I couldn't tell if some of this was because of this, you know, really grueling three-year campaign, um, where in a, anecdotally we've heard of a massive exodus of, of business, of, of Han residents, um, and sort of the economy kind of grinding to a halt. Or if it's, you know, probably the weather, the winter um, also plays a role. But, you know, I, I was just struck by on the right, this is in downtown Urumqi, sort of how, how slow everything seemed to be. Um, and, and we can talk about that later, you know, in terms of, of um, yeah, what's come out. Um, very interestingly, on the left, Kashgar, this was two weeks ago. Again, you see no more propaganda of this campaign. It's almost as if it's sort of been removed and changed, it's, it's morphed into something else. And so um, in this square, there's, there's still the police station. You see um, these banners kind of warning people to, to be careful of electronic fraud. And these are everywhere, all over Xinjiang, is be careful of electronic fraud. There's no more mention of, of, um, of, of extremism. And so you know, one theory could be that maybe um, they are still using just an overwhelming number of these banners and kind of you know, speakers blaring propaganda everywhere to keep people on a certain level of alert, um, but yet kind of superficially rolling back some of the campaign. Uh, let's see, okay, here is the main mosque in uh, Kashgar, very famous, the uh, Islamic Shahada sign that says, essentially, I am a Muslim. It's uh, here in the, in the entrance that's been removed, I think, one or two years ago. Chinese flag now in the courtyard. Um, it's been raised inside of a, of a, of a religious facility um, for the last couple of years. On the right, here is a, uh, a street in Hotan that used to have a checkpoint where it was one of these checkpoints once every 400 meters where literally every single car that drove through the middle of this town, no matter if you're from a taxi or driving your own car, you had to stop, you had to get out, you had to queue in the line that was like 20 minutes long, hand over your ID, they, they write it down, and you hand over your phone and they plug something into your phone to make sure that you have no sort of you know, extremist uh, content. Um, now it's a normal street. Okay, so what's next? Uh, this is the big question. I feel like we're sort of at a turning point in, in, in Xinjiang. Um, you know, the, the government has said that recently that they have um, sort of released everybody uh, from these camps. Uh, I think that there's a, a wide, uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of, of, of skepticism about that and, and sort of what things are sort of kind of morphing into. Um, here is a outside on this facility, it says, it, um, that sort of, you know, one man who has a job is a whole family that's, that's fed. And so it's basically a labor camp. Um, the local police, when they detained me, they acknowledged that it was a poverty relief uh, camp. But, but a lot of data shows that the labor in some of these um, facilities is coerced. Uh, there is evidence showing that this is happening and spreading beyond China to, to many, many provinces in the east and the northeast in the, in the north of China. Um, and, and, and forced labor uh, by Uyghurs and Kazakhs may even be contributing to the goods of uh, Western multinationals. I think you will hear more about that um, soon, including in the Washington Post. Uh, and so we also know that the, the number of convictions, the sentencing has skyrocketed in, in the last um, couple of years and people have been sentenced to very long prison terms. And so it seems that yes, some of these farmers uh, that they kind of got sucked into this giant dragnet 
uh, may be released. Um, others may have gotten these very long prison sentences in the formal judicial, judicial system, and yet many, many others, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands have been transferred into some of these work camps, uh, which still remain murky and deserve more investigation. So that's all I got. Um, speaking of labor, I'll let uh, Darren take it away. He's the, he's the man. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Jerry. Um, so now we have Darren Byler, um, who received his PhD from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington in 2018. His research focuses on Uyghur disposition, possession, cultural work, terror, capitalism in the city of Urumqi, um, the capital of Xinjiang. He's published research articles in the Asia Pacific Journal, Contemporary Islam, Central Asian Survey, the Journal of Chinese Contemporary Art, and contributed essays to volume, volumes on ethnography of Islam in China, transnational Chinese cinema, and travel and representation. He's provided expert testimony on Uyghur human rights issues before the Canadian House of Commons and writes a regular column on these issues for Sub China. And we're really excited to have him um, come talk to you guys today. So thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to pick up where, where Jerry left off, maybe fill in some of the details of things that he's, he's mentioned already, um, and work through some of my field work. So I spent two years in, in Xinjiang doing research, uh, learning Chinese, learning Uyghur, uh, hanging out with people, um, and then watching them disappear into these camps. And, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that, what that was like. Um, and I was just last week in Kazakhstan interviewing former detainees, so I'll also talk about uh, some of the, the detainee experiences. So I, there's lots of ways we can start telling this story, and Jerry's done, done one, one, one way of doing it. What, what I want to do is, is start in the, the 1990s, which was when the Chinese state began what they called the Open Up the Northwest campaign, which was a precursor to the Open Up the West campaign, which was a campaign to move capital to integrate the western part of China with the rest of China, with the eastern, eastern China. So in the 1990s, that's when China was really opening up to the, to the world. Um, it's when China became the manufacturer for the world and they needed to run their economy so it, it, an industrial scale and so they needed natural resources and one of the places to get natural resources is Xinjiang. Xinjiang has around 20% of, of Chinese oil, a little bit more than that uh, of coal and, and around 17% of, um, of uh, oh, sorry, 17% of oil, 21% of natural gas. So. In the 90s, they began to build out the hard infrastructure to get access to, to those resources. Um, and to do that, they had to bring lots of people, and sorry, I kind of missed this in my first slide. They had to bring lots of people there to build those, the, that infrastructure. So that's when we started to see large-scale migration of Han people from other parts of China to Xinjiang. There had already been a Chinese presence, a Han presence in Xinjiang. Um, but in the 90s, that's when the Uyghur majority areas, which are in the south part of the region, really began to see an influx of Han, Han migrants. Um, so they, when they arrived, they began to build that hard infrastructure, the pipelines, the roads, um, communications infrastructure. They brought with them a service industry as well. And so Uyghurs began to see the economy change. It began to be more integrated with, with the rest of China. Um, but they also saw themselves excluded from that new economy because most of these jobs in, this, in natural resource extraction and service were being directed towards Han people. The advertising for those jobs said uh, only Han people need apply to these jobs. Um, and so people, Uyghurs began to see the cost of living begin to rise um, in pretty dramatic ways, um, and, but, but at the same time not see any way into that new economy. And so people became more desperate, they began to move from rural areas to the city, um, and they began to try to find a way forward, um, but it was quite difficult for many. One way that they, they uh, found themselves positioned was as sort of sharecroppers or um, tenant farmers uh, in industrial agriculture, because the 90s was when they also began a rapid expansion of cotton production and also 
uh, in the next decade to motor production. So today, Xinjiang has around 84% of, of Chinese cotton and around 20 to 25% of the world's tomato production. Um, and Uyghurs are the primary cultivators of, of many of those, state, of those uh, raw products. In the 2000s, they began to really integrate China and integrate Xinjiang with China in a, in a new way, and that was through communications infrastructure. So in the 2000s, TV arrived, um, electricity arrived in the villages, and then in 2010, after uh, uh, the internet was turned off for a while, 3G networks came online. And so for the first time, people could get online um, using a smartphone. And so they got these you know, cheap Android devices, Huawei phones. Um, in my first year of field work, everyone was buying them, especially the young, young people. Um, and in 2012, they started to use a new app called WeChat, which was a China-specific domestic social media app um, that was freely available and accessible for Uyghurs to use. For Uyghurs, it was a game changer because they could use the, the um, the oral speech function to communicate with each other. So you can send verbal messages to, to other people. You don't even have to type anything. And because Uyghurs have varying degrees of computer literacy or literacy at all, um, and because a lot of computer devices don't have an integrated keyboard to allow them to type in Uyghur, that oral speech function was uh, really a, a way for them to use technology that, that didn't require a lot of knowledge. It also went around the censorship uh, capabilities of the state, uh, because the state wasn't really able to assess oral speech. Um, and so they began to think that WeChat was a sort of open space to talk about um, jobs, eco the economy, um, but also to talk about politics and to talk about religion. And, and that, in the end, began to really, um, but they didn't realize that they were leaving a digital footprint that would be used against them in the years to come. So in 2011, when I did my first field, year of field work, I saw lots of people coming from rural areas to the city. Um, they were looking for jobs. They were also looking for religious freedom. Um, because in the rural areas, there's a lot of human surveillance. Uh, so everyone is in each other's business. And if you go to the mosque, everyone knows. But in the city, there's lots of people, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Um, and so you can go to the mosque, and no one seems to notice. And so on Fridays in 2014, when I did a second year of field work, this is what the prayer uh, time looked like in the, in the middle of the day. This is the busiest mosque time. There was more people than could fit inside the mosque to pray. Um, these are mostly migrants. These are people that came to the city to find religious freedom and to find jobs. Um, and the two are connected because the mosque community often provided a way of getting into an economic system, a way of finding jobs. The mosque wasn't the space where real Islam was found, though. That's what many of these migrants told me. They said in the mosque, the, the imams are trained by the state. There's uh, camera systems, so you can't speak freely about Islam. Instead. Islam was taught around the mosque in the prayer rooms that were in restaurants nearby. It was shared on people's phones via Bluetooth, via WhatsApp, or WeChat, um, and via SD cards. Um, and so many people were listening to what they called tablig, which are teachings about Islam. Most of these were taught by, by Uyghur uh, teachers. Some of them were based in Xinjiang. Others were based in Turkey, uh, where Jerry was. Um, some were based in Uzbekistan, because Uzbek and Uyghur are very close. Um, mostly what they were interested in was Hanafi Sunni Islam, very mainstream forms of Islam. What does it mean to be a Muslim today? How should we pray? How should we eat? Uh, what does a proper marriage look like? All of these sorts of questions that people had. They said they couldn't find out about Islam in their regular life, and so they were using their phones to do it um, in these spaces around the mosque. In May 2014, this began to change. This is when, um, as Jerry mentioned, there was a large-scale incident at a train station. And they began what they called the People's War on Terror. It's a, an extension of an earlier hard strike campaign. And so in the neighborhoods where I was living, these posters were erected um, throughout the neighborhoods. And it said that Uyghurs were no longer allowed to have beards. They were no longer allowed to have Islamic symbols on their clothing. And the women should no longer veil themselves. 
and doing so would result in detention. And so already in 2014, I started to see people disappear um, to, to be sent to what were the precursor for the camps that came later. So what were the goals of the people's war on terror? Um, it's similar to the, the global war on terror, to the war on terror that's been fought by the, U, the, the US has done the unending war. Um, but it's, it's pointed in a different direction. In this case, the terrorists are a group of, of minority Muslims that are citizens of the state where the war is taking place. It's not using drones or, or occupation in a, in, of a foreign country. Um, instead, it's using cameras, digital media, biometric checkpoints, prisons, internment camps, and coerced labor factories. Um, so it's, it's building on what the US has done in terms of counterinsurgency and also counter, countering, violent extreme, or countering, countering violent extremism, the CVE programs that they've, they've built in many places around the world now. Um, but it's, it's doing it at a different scale and with different effects. Um, I call this, uh, this system that's been built a kind of capitalism, a kind of terror capitalism. Um, because it's allowing the Chinese state and private industry to build a new security complex um, that allows them to develop new technologies and also to uh, produce a new population of laborers. Um, so it's, it's utilizing a new sequence in racialization, producing this group of people called the Uyghurs as proto-terrorists, um, that are they're marked as Uyghur, as Muslim and ethnic, um, and then exploiting their behavior um, in terms of their daily activity to build data sets, and then uh, in some cases using their labor as well um, in, in a sense where they don't have to pay them very much. Uh, it's utilizing the discourse of terrorism to produce a kind of state of exception where the normal rules don't apply. This is a state of emergency, and so we can do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, so it's, it's, and if you look at the Chinese policing, uh, like the theory documents, the kind of academic essays, um, they talk about very directly that they're learning from the U.S. approach to counterinsurgency, the Israeli approach to counterinsurgency, um, and they're utilizing it, they're, they're doing a better job of it. So they, they call it, you know, counterinsurgency with Chinese characteristics, or preventative policing with Chinese characteristics, uh, community policing, um, where they're detaining people as pre-criminals, as pre-terrorists. Um, it's producing two new modes of production. One of them is this new labor, this new labor model, and the second one is uh, the predictive policing uh, technologies or tools um, that can be used in a whole, whole range of ways. And I'll, I'll explain it as I move forward through this. Who are the actors in this security industrial complex? It's really three main actors. It's state security, uh, higher education, these research institutes, um, and also private industry. And they're, they're working together uh, to, the, the initial goal beginning in 2011 really already was to break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet, the, the WeChat that, that Uyghurs were able to use. It's, they had some ways of controlling Uyghur internet, which was basically turning it, turning it off, but they couldn't really regulate the speech, um, and so they had to automate ways of, of detecting speech um, and translating it and then being able to assess it. There's now 1,400 tech firms that are working in Xinjiang, um, and in 2017-18, they invested $7.2 billion um, in security technology. There's just a, I'll just give you a couple examples of the applications that have been built. One of them is, is a, a tool that automates the recovery and scanning um, and analysis of deleted files and applications on people's smartphones or computers. And that's the device that you see here. Or maybe you can't quite see it there. Um, I, I can't show you what the point of it's up there in the corner. Um, the, another device was the auto transcription, translation, and assessment of Uyghur speech. So they translate, auto, they automate the translation into Chinese, and then they can scan it and see, you know, what were people saying? Were they talking about tablets? Were they talking about uh, Islamic teaching? Were they talking about uh, anything extremist? They also began a project to automate the detection. Um, of Uyghur faces based on the phenotypes of the person's face. And that's the model that you see here. Um, 
so far, I don't think they're fully successful in doing that because uh, there's a whole range of ways that Uyghurs appear. Um, they say they have around 30% success rate um, in, in automating the detection of, of Uyghur faces. Um, the way that these applications are used is in face surveillance or face recognition camera systems. So they detect people as they move down the street. And if they detect a Uyghur, then the police can be notified and, and respond. Um, Jerry mentioned that one of the ways that this is built out is through a grid police system. Um, so when you go to the region, you see these police st stations almost everywhere, the, the uh, convenience for the people police stations. Uh, these are part of a grid system. So they become, they actually act as a sort of surveillance hub. Um, where they have you know, a dozen to 20 police officers stationed in that space, and they conduct randomized checkpoints of people walking down the street, asking for their IDs and for their phones, and they scan their phones. They also have biometric checkpoints where people go through these checkpoints and, and have to scan their face and ID. Um, so at each, each kind of housing area, um, or shelter has its own police station like this, um, and they're responsible for all the activities that happen in their, in their section of the grid. So when people are placed under sort of house arrest, they're, they're placed within the sort of grid system. Um, there's these checkpoints that you'll find at every jurisdictional boundary. So when you go in, into an institution, like a bank or a mall or a university, um, you'll scan your ID and it'll be matched to your face. And this might be changing um, over the last uh, year or so. Uh, but when I was there in 2018, this is what it was like. Um, and this was supported by a really unprecedented data collection program. Jerry mentioned this already as well. Um, all Uyghurs, all residents of the region were asked to go to the local uh, police station and submit biometric data, uh, which meant that they had their face scanned in many cases, or at least their irises scanned. Um, people that went into the camps definitely had their face scanned uh, in all of the interviews I've done. Um, and they also had their voice recorded. So you had to read a text several times until they got a unique voice signature for you. And they also gave fingerprints, blood type, voice patterns. I uh, already did that, I already said that. Um, and, the, and, the, and they gave the DNA. 36 million people participated, which is more than the population of the region. So it was more than 100% participation, uh, which is really unprecedented for a, a public health initiative. In addition to this, they began to send people into uh, Uyghur homes um, and Kazakh homes, Muslim homes in general, and assess people to decide who is safe, unsafe, or normal. Um, and this is what that uh, metrics look like, the metrics of that look like. Um, there's really 10 categories. You start off with 100 points. Um, and for each category that applies to you, you're, you're deducted 10 points. Um, so if you're between the ages of 15 and 55, military age, minus 10. If you're Uyghur, minus 10. If you're unemployed, minus 10, which is a huge population of the Uyghurs is underemployed. Um, if you have a passport, minus 10. If you visited one of 26 banned countries or overstayed a visa, minus 10. If you have a relative living abroad, minus 10. And the number five, six, and 10 were, were the real crucial ones. Uh, they're the ones where they're assessing how much does this person pray? Do they pray regularly? Do they go to the mosque regularly? Do they go to the mosque on Friday? Um, and do they possess religious knowledge? And here when they say possess religious knowledge, they mean um, really any kind of knowledge about Islam. Uh, so do they, have they ever studied Arabic? Have they ever studied Turkish? Um, have they listened to any of those tablets, those teachings on their phone? Have they been part of a WeChat group that studies Islam? Um, have they ever had the technologies, the capacity on their phone to study Islam, such as have they ever used a VPN? Have they ever used WhatsApp? Um, all of these, these uh, um, forms of technology that are seen as, as subversive or potentially extremist. Um, so many, many people were caught uh, with number six on this list. Um, the number 10 is about, did you ever teach your children about Islam in your home? And because that's, that's not permitted. So have you ever taught your, your children how to pray? Um, have you ever taught them to fast during Ramadan? Um, those are all signs of extremism and a, tr and a sign of being unsafe. 
it's not clear exactly how these metrics worked, and I think they work differently in different locales in terms of, you know, if you are at 60%, you are sent to the camp, or if you're 50%, you're sent to the camp. But in any case, if a number of these, these categories apply to you, you are, you will move from the, the uh, safe position to the normal position and, and probably into that unsafe position. Through these assessments, hundreds of thousands of people were sent to prison. Um, so in 2017 and 18, over 500,000 people in this region were sent to prison, uh, which is a, a really staggering number of people and is in, in the proportion of numbers of convictions or prosecutions in China it is really, um, is really unprecedented. Um, so in 2018, 363,000 people sent to prison in this region, um, and the total population of people sent to prison is, is just uh, 1.3 million. Um, many in the, that weren't sent to the prison were sent to the camp, and we don't really have very solid numbers on how many that is, maybe 1.5 million. Um, these camps are throughout the region. Um, and they also work in concert with a, a SWA system. So there's control SWAs that are part of the system, which are sort of jails. Um, and people are often held there before they go to the camp. Um, it seems as though there's not always spaces in the camps, and so they're waiting for spaces to open up um, to move people forward through the, through the camp system. These are not training centers. They are not, uh, they're not schools in a straightforward sense. We see very clearly from the bidding contracts um, that they are weaponized prison spaces. They're using surveillance systems, uh, that are using face surveillance in, in many cases. Uh, they're using razor wire, stun guns, <clears throat> electric batons, handcuffs, spike clubs. When you go to, this, go to these spaces, you have a hood put over your face and your, your hands are shackled behind your back. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a really awful space. This is one of the images we have from inside one of these camps. Um, Jerry already mentioned it in his slides. Um, it's not really representative of what life is like because people are actually held inside the cells for the majority of their time. Um, they're watched through cameras. Um, for the majority of their time. In some cases, they're, they're taken to classes, maybe two times a week, sometimes five times a week. Um, but most of the time is in a small cell that's about the, a little bit larger than this, pla than this platform up here. Um, there's often a toilet inside the, platform, inside the, the cell. Um, and there's cameras on all sides. The lights are always turned on. They're very bright. Um, if I, in a new version of this slideshow, I'll bring a picture of a small plastic stool uh, because what the detainees tell me is that they spend most of their time sitting on a stool, a small plastic stool, um, and they're not permitted to sit on their beds or the platform that's beside them. Instead, they have to sit on that stool and they have to ask permission to get up from the stool. Um, so many people develop back problems or uh, problems with their anatomy because of having to sit in that position. In 2018, we began to see people move from the camp space to other camps, uh, to prisons, to factories. Um, this was a, a, an image that we were able to geolocate as being in Kuala around August 2018. Um, people are being moved, you can see on the back of their vests, um, that they're being moved from a place in uh, Kashgar, from Yuburga, uh, to Kuala. It's not entirely clear why they're being moved, but we began to see in the satellite images that they're beginning to build factory spaces around the camps. Um, and in many cases, since we've, we've heard uh, from former detainees that they're being moved into garment factories that were newly built. Um, these are people that had passed through the re-education system. They had passed the test. They'd done all the self-criticisms. Um, and they were qualified to work in the factories. It seems as though the majority, or at least a significant number of those people were women. Um, and, but it's, it's hard to really assess the demographics. One of the things that the state says that they want to do is they want to move one million textile jobs to Xinjiang uh, by 2023. Um, remember I said at the beginning that 84% of Chinese cotton comes from this region, so it makes a lot of sense that they would want to move manufacturing to the region. This has something to do with the rising cost of labor in eastern China, in Xinjiang and other places. Um, 
already jobs are being are, are moving to Vietnam and Bangladesh. Um, so building these new spaces in Xinjiang and, and producing this new labor force makes a lot of sense um, if you want to keep manufacturing in China. Um, 84% of Chinese cotton comes from this region, which is about a, a third or so of the world's cotton supply. Um, so many, many retailers are caught up in this, in this uh, production. Um, all of these brands that I have listed here um, have either sourced their cotton in this space or manufacture cotton directly using Uyghur labor. I begin to end by just um, telling you the story of, of one of the women I, I interviewed last week in Kazakhstan. Her name is Gulzira Alkan. She was found guilty of watching Turkish TV and of traveling to Kazakhstan. She also had a passport, which were three marks against her. Um, so when she came back to, to uh, China from Kazakhstan, where she had been living there for quite a while and she had her family there, she was, came back to take care of her grandma or her mother. Um, she was detained two days later and sent to a camp. Uh, inside the camp was one of those cells I just described. She said the hardest thing was uh, toilet, the toileting, uh, because they were only allowed to have two minutes on the toilet once a day. Um, and it was, they didn't drink a lot, of course, because they're not given, well, they're not given kaisu, they're not given hot water. Um, they only get joe uh, or some kind of porridge that has cabbage in it. One of the other detainees said it was food for dogs. Um, and they're only given two minutes on the toilet, so they have to try really hard to go when they're on the toilet. Um, and if they exceed their time, she said that in her cell, uh, they would receive uh, beatings. They would, get sh they would use the stun gun or the, the cattle prod device, it's not clear what it was exactly, to hit people in the head. Um, she said they did it in the head because the bruises wouldn't show there. Um, and so she was stunned many times, um, and many people were stunned. She saw this happen often. Um, she was in the camp for about a year, and then, and then she was told that she would be released. And so she was sent uh, back to her village for a couple days, um, and then the local authorities the persons that were assigned to her said, now you're going to go work in a factory. And so she went to work in this factory, uh, which was back very close to the camp where she had just been. Um, the factory space was, uh, there was a number of different factories. And the one that she was sent to was one that manufactured gloves. Um, she was told that for the first three months, she would be paid 600 yuan because she was an intern. She was uh, someone who was just training. And, in fact, she was actually paid only 300 yuan because they said uh, the cost of housing her, of giving her transportation, um, meant that they should garnish some of her wages. Uh, this was her manager in the factory. He came often to the camp when he was selecting the workers to go to the factory. Uh, he's a guy from Hebei, uh, I think. Um, and he said that the, they were providing a lot of jobs in this government video. He said that they're providing a lot of jobs to these people They've created a 1,500 jobs in, this, in just one year, and by the end of this 2018, they would have 2,000 jobs. Um, and he said that they've generated $6 million in profits uh, since coming to Xinjiang. So the AIDS Xinjiang campaign that he was a part of was a real success. Hosea was only paid 300 yuan, which was um, less than a sixth of the minimum wage. And on top of that, she was paid around one penny per pair of gloves that she completed. The gloves are being sold primarily in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, and if you go to the Alibaba site for the company, you can see that they're, they're actually, some of them quite pricey. The expensive ones up there in the corner go for $24 a pair. Um, so there's a lot of profit that's being made in this space, and not much of it is going to the workers. So to conclude, um, what is being produced through this? From a Uyghur perspective, from a Kazakh perspective, it's a systematic form of unfreedom. It's open air prisons, that's how they often refer to it. Um, it's also producing a weakening of the last institutions of Uyghur society, their faith, their Islamic practice, uh, their language is being eradicated in many cases, especially in the younger generation, and families are being torn apart. The family separation is really widespread throughout the system, and that's really one of the most damaging aspects of it. There's also forms of elimination of, of native identity, um, what Uyghurs call Yellik identity. Um, and that comes from the removal of graves, through the destruction of, of towns and of, of dwellings. 
um, through the removal of key leaders in Uyghur society, the cultural leaders, and through the halting of Uyghur language, education, um, and literary production, all of that. From the state's perspective, what's being produced is a kind of permanent stability. It's the final solution to the Xinjiang problem. Um, they're also um, producing this new labor force, which they say in a government document said that it's become a, a carrier of the economy for Xinjiang. So they see a lot of potential in, in developing, especially cotton and garment, garment and, and textile production. It's also producing un, unlimited forms of tech, technological growth, according to the tech industry, um, because they're developing all these new tools to assess populations, control populations, and so they see unlimited potential to build similar programs, similar systems in places in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So they said that Belt and Road itself um, is a space where all of this can be rolled out in, in new ways. And they say 60% of the world's Muslim population is on the Belt and Road, and so there's unlimited potential. Um, there's many ways we can push back against this, um, and, and some of those things are already put in place. I mean, Jerry going there last week and seeing that so much has changed because of Western pressure um, shows us that there's a lot of, of effect that we can have. Um, but the situation is not, is not going away. It's not going away soon. Um, and many, many, many Uyghurs are suffering in, in really, um, really extreme ways. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much.